I absolutely loved Central Park. Central Park is like center of the universe, kind of. But by the 1980s, this place that was meant to be a central recreation hub for the entire city really becomes more of a barrier. Night would fall and it would change. It would become a place where you'd be nervous about going. Well, in 1989, you must remember that the city was in a real divisive, polarized condition. This is a sort of cauldron in which the Central Park jogger narrative emerged. Tonight, a look at a case that captivated the nation. A group of teens accused of raping a young banker out on an evening jog that became a lightning rod at the intersection of class, race, and politics in America. That Wednesday night, it was Easter vacation. Kids, we could hang out a little later because there was no school to Monday. And I seen a group of kids entering the park. At the time, I followed. You go from hanging out with friends, thinking that you're going to go skateboarding in the park or walk around the lake to mayhem. Now we just got a call of a disorderly group, about 30 to 40 male inside Central Park, tackling disorderly and harassing people. We started to get a lot of radio runs of a group of black and Hispanic teenagers assaulting and harassing people. Pick up of an assault at 102 and East Drive in Central Park. It's a roving band. I would run to the park, usually entering at the 84th Street entrance just by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The whole thing was very chaotic. We were getting a lot of 911 calls. They're chasing a large group over there, about 30 to 40 people. There's a big foot chase. There's a couple of cars come, scooters. When it was all said and done, we had five kids. And at first, it seems like a relatively minor thing. They're going to send these kids to family court. And then this woman is found in the park, covered in blood, near death. Trish Miley, not conscious, barely barely alive. She actually had been dragged down to the stream in the ravine. The discovery of Trish Mealy lying in a ravine changes everything. I have seen traumatized patients many, many times, but I have never seen somebody like destroyed. This is the cheekbone, and this was crushed severely. We all know what rape is. I mean, everybody knows what that is and describe it. But there's nothing like seeing something like this, the atrocity of such an act. We ended up with five arrests. Two of the five were Kevin Richardson and Raymond Santana. We had to go back out and start getting more of the kids that were involved in the attack. That included Yusuf Salam, Corey Weiss, and Antron McCray. With pressure mounting to solve the case, days of questioning began. Those who are 14 and 15 are supposed to have a parent or guardian present, and largely they do, but then even the parents, I think, are pretty naive about what's going on. They used us. They used our lack of knowledge of the justice system against us. They were all starting to talk and give stories about what happened. So these interrogations, they're, they're not recorded in any way, right? They're not even written down. These are not my rules. These are the rules I was handed. And that's what we play by. I really didn't know what was going on. I just wanted to get the hell home. The lead investigator in my case, he became fed up and he slammed his fist on the table. He's going to give me what I want and he lunged at me. If you take an individual that's 15 years old and you put that individual in a room by themselves with two to four to six officers, some of them wanting to attack you, that individual will be terrified. It could be almost tantamount to someone having a gun to your head. All of these kids, and in many cases their parents, believed that they would get to go home if they implicated other people, if they were helpful in the right way, and they were desperate to get out of that room. No detective of mine would ever say anything like that. You're gonna go home, it would crime like this, Never. They played the parents against each other. They played the boys against each other. And they made up all of these stories to get their arrest and their convictions. How do you coerce somebody when he's sitting there with his parents? It's OK. Elizabeth Lederer was the prosecutor in the Central Park jogger case. 
By all accounts, she was incredibly diligent. She was not one of these prosecutors who were just in it to win. In the early hours of the morning on the second day, under questioning, the teenagers make a fateful decision. They decide to start talking on videotape. This is my first rape. This, I never did this before in this school room, my last time doing it. After a night in police custody, Kevin Richardson starts to talk, implicating himself in this night of mayhem with numerous assaults and possibly the rape of Tricia Miley. Everybody was around her. And I came, I came over there. And it's not just Richardson. Other teenagers are implicating themselves on video, too. I start hitting that stuff. And she's on the ground. Everybody's stomping and everything. All of them except Youssef Salam. He never goes on video and never makes a written statement. When I first saw those tapes, I didn't disbelieve them. Like anybody else, when I watch a confession tape, my first impulse is, whoa, an innocent person really wouldn't do that. But you told that to the police before, was it true? I'm never saying this. My second impulse is to listen to the details and to be influenced by them. How did those marks get on her head? I shouldn't say that those aren't the marks of a knife. She has a fractured skull. She was hit with a very, very heavy object here. Corey, you saw that picture. You don't get these lines. You don't get a fractured skull. No, the more, the more it looks like it's, it's, it's from like, it's like a rock. When you watch Corey, it's almost like he's desperate to get it right. He tells one story at this moment, he tells this story at another moment. Well, yeah, when you look at false confession cases, it's because when they told the truth, you didn't believe them and you made them change it. Of course, there are going to be some inconsistencies between the statements. And in my experience, when you take statements, there's kind of a range, right? Meanwhile, Tricia Miley is clinging to life in the hospital. She was in a coma for oh, a week, and then she started opening her eyes and looking around. Little did she know she was waking up into a media firestorm. A terror spree through Central Park. They found her and they gang raped her. The shock waves of the tragedy felt both north and south of the park. It took politics, power, rape, racial politics, controversy, and it all contributed to this heightened sense of fear in New York and this thirst for vengeance. The first trial involved three defendants, Raymond Santana, Antron McRae, and Youssef Salam. Clearly, the statements were the most important evidence. The looks on the jurors' faces when they watched those videotapes told a devastating story for the defense. It's clear, as it has been for a year, that prosecutors will depend on videotape statements by the suspects themselves. But when the defense went on offense this afternoon, its strategy also became clear. The teen's lawyers say confessions were cleverly staged. There was a huge problem in this case. They didn't have DNA evidence against these defendants. They didn't have physical evidence against these defendants. So we as prosecutors were completely upfront with the jury about the fact that semen had been recovered from Trisha Miley, the female jogger, which did not match any of the people that were on trial. After 10 days of deliberations, the verdict, Yusuf Salam, Raymond Santana, and Antron McRae, all 16, were convicted of the rape and assault of the Central Park jogger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next trial was Kevin Richardson and Corey Wise, and once again, the prosecution relied on those confessions. The tape was brutal. In fact, it was so graphic, some of the jurors, at least a couple of them, looked like they were having a hard time watching it. In the second trial, the jury struggled with Corey Wise's confessions. There were two statements. They were all over the place. The facts were contradictory, self-contradicted. I didn't believe that he had anything to do with the rape. Corey Wise's confession didn't make any sense. Several of the jurors kept at me and at me. They pushed me to go to the other direction. And I wish to God I just hung the jury on that. And, and that's, that's been my biggest regret for 30 years. Terry Wise found guilty of sexual abuse, first-degree assault, and riot. 
Then, with respect to Kevin Richardson, guilty on every charge. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.